Good morning, and thanks for joining me for Rise and Crime, your morning caffeine hit all about crime. I'm Mama Jules, and let's start with the Oklahoma third grade teacher who didn't drink and drive. She drank and taught. 53-year-old Kimberly Coates showed up for work at Perkins Tryon Intermediate School on the first day of the school year, ready for a big day. I just don't think that big day was what you and I would have expected. Kimberly was confronted by school administrators near the end of the school day at 3.20 p.m. last week. Now, teachers and administrators were concerned about her behavior, and they had alerted law enforcement, who all then converged in the principal's office to discuss her behavior. Now, the whole entire action in the principal's office lasted more than 40 minutes, but Fox News has provided a scaled-down version, and the police body cam footage begins with Kimberly taking a breathalyzer test being administered by the school resource officer, and it ends with her empty cup that has wine residue in the bottom. Here, let's just have you give a listen. I don't know how to do this. You're just going to blow into it like you're blowing up a balloon as soon as I tell you to. All right, ready? Take a big deep breath. Blow, 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 blow. All right, stop. Good job. You want to tell me the truth? How much you had to drink? I drank last night. There's no way you drank last night. Well, I did drink last night. Did you drink at school is what he's asking you. Tell us the truth. I, I didn't drink at school. That wouldn't blow that right there. You blew right two times the legal limit. I did? Yeah. Here's our drink that you have. What's in this drink? That's a Diet Coke. Is there anything like liquor in it? Nope. So if I go into the classroom, am I going to find anything else? Did you go to your vehicle and drink if we go out and search your car? No. So where did the liquor come from? Did you leave campus? Not today. Have you... This thing is pretty accurate. No, I know it is. So I, know, I know it is. You blew like a .24. I don't know what that means. What's Legal that? limit's .08. Okay. Do you drink often? Unfortunately, yes. Yes, okay. Yeah. I'm not trying to insult you. I'm just trying to understand no, no, why. No, no, I, I, I'm seeing a counselor. I'm seeing a counselor about it, so. You actually mean it, though. Some people don't. Okay, no more games, right? Yeah. What is in that? Uh, uh, my juice. Okay. Okay. Uh, what's in that? Can I try again? That there is wine. I thought that was from yesterday. Are you drinking uh, up here yesterday? Uh, well, I bought it from home. I, I, I'm gonna have uh, Spencer come in the back oh way God. and I'll oh take God. her out the back way. Oh my God. But she's lied and lied and uh, Mr. Ogle found a cup that had wine residue in it on her desk, so. See, Kimberly had seemed off and not quite like the same person, according to Doug Ogle, the school superintendent. He had seen her earlier in the day, and he was just surprised about her behavior. So when confronted by both the officer and Mr. Ogle, Kimberly said she had taken medication the night before for anxiety, but she just could not remember the name of the prescription. After changing her story multiple times, she finally agreed to take the breath test where she blew a blood alcohol concentration of 0.24. Now that's three times the legal limit of 0.08, according to law enforcement. And Kimberly then changed her story again, saying that she had drank the night before and while on her way to work that morning. Well, Superintendent Ogle, he leaves the room for a short bit. And then he returns with Kimberly's tote bag and an empty blue plastic cup. Now, as the superintendent slams the cup to the conference table, he says to Kimberly, no more games, right? And then asks her what's in the cup. She responds with her juice. Now, the school resource officer smells the cup, and then the superintendent says, want to try that again? 
And then he matter-of-factly states, that there is wine. Now, Kimberly, I'm guessing still attempting to cover her tracks. She says that the cup was used the previous day and that she had not drunk out of it during her work hours. Now, something you didn't hear in the video that I played is the fact that law enforcement gave Kimberly multiple opportunities to tell her story. They also said if she would call someone to take her home, that the police wouldn't arrest her, but that she would lose her job. Now, she mostly just ignores their offers until the school resource officer calls for backup and explains to Kimberly that she's being arrested. Kimberly then begs for the officer to not cuff her and also begs for all to be forgiven. And eventually, the officer walks Kimberly out of the school through a back door. He's graciously avoiding all contact with children remaining in the school. Now, Kimberly was taken to the Payne County Jail, and it was expected to be charged with public intoxication. And the superintendent in the body cam footage does tell Kimberly she's going to lose her job. Okay, I learned some things from watching the entire body cam footage. At one point, the officer asks Kimberly if she has any drugs on her. He then searches her pockets and finds a single drug capsule in her front pant pocket of her jeans. And he reminds her that she cannot have any drugs on school campuses that are not contained in their bottles. So who knew? She was breaking the rules by having what she claimed was fish oil, not in the original packaging. Now, there were also parts of this video where I really felt for Kimberly. Okay, don't get me wrong. If I was a parent of a child in her third grade classroom, I would be furious about this. But it was also easy to see that Kimberly truly has a problem. And hopefully this will help her get the counseling she needs. And then one more thing. The school resource officer and the administrator, well, they keep their patients for nearly the entire video. In a situation where they could have unleashed on Kimberly, they kept it relatively cool. And isn't that what we hope for in positions of leadership? All right, finally, the school district did make a public statement to parents saying that no further information would be shared because it has been deemed a personnel issue. All right, and when you just thought the Murdoch murder saga out of South Carolina was over, Now, Buster Murdoch, the surviving and not jailed member of the family, is speaking out. Remember, if you know the Murdochs, you know death. They have a housekeeper who suspiciously tripped on a back step of the hunting property and died of her head wound. And that housekeeper's family was then left high and dry as Buster's father, Alex, stole all the insurance money from the death benefit payout. Okay, so there was that one. Now there's Mallory Beach, the innocent 19-year-old who died while riding in a boat driven by Buster's brother, Paul. Now, Paul ran that boat into a bridge pillar, and Mallory was catapulted into the dark waters of the Chichesi River. She was found several days later, having drowned following her severe head wound in the boat accident. And of course, you have the deaths of Paul and Paul's and Buster's mother, Maggie. Now, those two were shot at the hunting property, And Paul and Buster's father, Alec, was found guilty this year of those slayings. Prosecutors said Alec was covering up for his drug abuse and financial misdeeds, and he really needed to kill the two, specifically Paul, because Paul was embroiled in a criminal charge for the death of Mallory Beach, and getting rid of Paul might free up funds, and it will also make it possible to cover up his other misdeeds, all of that at least according to prosecutors and their theory at the trial. Okay, now that leaves Buster with his father in prison serving two life sentences and his brother and mother dead. And he's finally speaking out in a three-part Fox Nation exclusive that begins tonight. In a clip from the Fox exclusive, Buster says he stands by his father, believing he is innocent, and then he doubles down when he says his father did not hire anyone to kill his mother and brother. Here, let's take a listen to Buster. If you believe your dad's innocent, your mom and your brother's killer is out there somewhere. That's what I believe. Would he get someone else to do it? No, ma'am. I don't think that he could be affiliated with endangering my mother and brother. I mean, that's, I mean, we've been here for a while now and that's been my stance. I was thinking that I don't know what or how bad everything was going to get or how bad everything had gotten for him. 
but I do know that I do not think that his justification and his out of whatever storm he concocted was to kill my mother and brother. What did you feel like when you heard that this thing was surfacing again? Well, it's a lot like this, and, and you know, I, I don't want to be rude here, but have you ever been accused of murdering somebody? No. Well, let me tell you this, it is very, 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 it, it's a terrible thing to place on somebody with absolutely no fact. I mean, it has harmed my reputation. I mean, people perceive me as a murderer. So are you fearful for your life if you believe the killer is still out there? Absolutely. I think that I've set myself up to be safe. But yes, when I go to bed at night, I have a fear that there is somebody else still out there. Now, Buster even takes it further in the Fox special by saying he fears for his life every single day, believing the real killer is still out there. Now, Alec has appealed his conviction of the murders, but that was swiftly denied by the judge, saying that the evidence of guilt was overwhelming. When the Fox Nation host, Martha McCallum, asks Buster if he believes his father is a psychopath, he responded with the following. I'm not prepared to sit here and say that it encompasses him as a whole, but I certainly think there are characteristics where you look at the manipulation and the lies and the carrying out of that such, and I think that's a fair assessment. Well, that's pretty heavy by Buster to say that about his dad, but it is important to note that Alec was found guilty of bilking several families out of millions of dollars. And typically his schemes included stealing insurance money from clients with debilitating injuries. So Buster could be referring to those lies, or he could also be referring to the fact that his father revealed on the stand during the murder trial that he had lied about being at the hunting property on the night of his son and wife's deaths. Okay, see, he initially said he found the two dead later in the evening, but that was shown to be not true when prosecutors played a Snapchat video recorded by his son, Paul. Okay, in the video, taken just moments before Paul and Maggie were shot, Paul records three voices, his voice, his mother's voice, and then Alec's voice. This left Alec with really no other option than to admit on the witness stand that he had lied. Okay, but there's still a murder I haven't included in this update. Buster has been thrown into the murder rumor mill when it comes to the death of his classmate, Stephen Smith. Now, Stephen was thought to be killed in a hit and run accident in 2015, but some law enforcement and Stephen's family specifically, they have taken issue with the findings. So where does Buster fit into that? Well, the two played baseball together at Wade Hampton High School and were said to be friends, but that friendship became complicated because Stephen was openly gay. And then the rumor mill, which linked the two romantically, well, that rumor mill kicked into high gear when Stephen's family had his body exhumed for a second autopsy earlier this year. Now, Buster spoke out against those rumors in a statement that said he had tried his best to ignore the rumors about him being involved in Stephen's tragic death, but he then goes on and says that's just difficult as he struggles to deal with his own mother and brother's deaths. Andy rejected all involvement in Stephen's death and called all the rumors baseless. He then said he is requesting the media to stop publishing defamatory comments and those rumors. Now in the Fox Nation special, Buster answers the question about where he was on the night of Stephen's death. He says he was at the Adesto Beach House. When asked if there was anyone with him, he responded saying he was with his brother and mother. So unfortunately, his two alibi witnesses, well, they're no longer able to address that alibi. Now, he did reaffirm that the rumors and accusations have harmed his reputation. He says this about that harm, that the whole thing is very, 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 very terrible. Okay, that's five varies. Now, Stephen's death has been deemed a homicide, and South Carolina's law enforcement division is continuing the investigation. The Fall of the House of Murdoch airs tonight on Fox Nation. And now, this story of a Utah teen who shot and killed his girlfriend following an argument. 
16-year-old Jackie Nunez Milan and 17-year-old Francisco Dante Aguilar were on again, off again, a couple. They had a relationship going on, but it was tumultuous. And they live in the small town of Junction, Utah. And when I say small, (laughs) the census lists the population at 191. Now, there are more people located in the rural areas of Paiute County, and that makes up the school population of 155 students for Paiute High School. Now, the high school has grades 7 through 12 in it. So if you just do some quick math, it shows the average amount of kids per grade level to be 25. So that's 25 kids in your whole grade if you're a graduating senior. Okay, that's kind of weird to wrap your brain around for most of us who didn't have a single individual classroom with less than 25 students, let alone your entire class just being 25 students. But that country atmosphere, that small town atmosphere, well, it makes for a close knit community where everyone knows everyone. And the death of Jackie hit Paiute High School hard. With such a small school, Jackie was able to participate on the volleyball, basketball, and softball teams, and she was the wrestling statistician. Okay, well, it was a Sunday evening in January, and court documents report that Jackie and Francisco were arguing. The exact wording says that they were making each other angry. I think that's a little weird, but that's how the court documents read. Whatever the issue, Francisco and Jackie went for a drive. And it wasn't a pleasant Sunday night jaunt. Francisco was so angry that he had taken his father's 9 millimeter with him on the emotionally fueled excursion. And the anger had reached a point where Jackie's friend McCall went looking for Jackie. She eventually discovered the two in a remote area called Black Hill, Utah. When McCall pulled closer to the two, Jackie broke out running, hoping to reach McCall's car and get away from the situation. That's when Francisco began firing. A bullet hit Jackie in the right leg, shattering her femur. Francisco then fires multiple shots toward McCall's car. And bullets shattered her windows as she drove away in fear that she would be killed. Now, Francisco's anger wasn't over. He approached Jackie, who lay wounded and bleeding in the roadway, and shot her in the head. Now, police arrived quickly at the Black Hill area and found Jackie dead in the roadway. About an hour later, Francisco was tracked down by law enforcement and arrested following a brief police pursuit. Now, police did use tire spikes to immobilize Francisco's car and make the arrest a little more simple. Now, Francisco was charged with aggravated murder and a felony discharge of a firearm. And at Paiute High School, homecoming week activities were changed and vigils were held instead. I just want to pause here. I think this is kind of cool. In a small school like that, you can do lots of different things that you wouldn't probably be able to get away with in a big school. One of them being they do a winter homecoming to celebrate the other sports that you don't get to celebrate in the fall. So here it is January and they're doing the homecoming activities and now Jackie dies. Okay, remember, Jackie was the stat girl for the wrestling team. And her friend Sandra, who shared the stat girl duties with Jackie, said following the homecoming wrestling match that she didn't think she could keep helping the team without Jackie, that her absence was just too painful. And at that homecoming wrestling match, Jackie's vacant chair was covered in stuffed animals and balloons. And students gathered following the duel to hold a candlelight vigil for Jackie. Well, Francisco, he pleaded guilty to his charges And the judge had harsh words for Francisco. Okay, see, Francisco had tried to claim that he brought the gun along on that fateful drive as a scare tactic. And when the judge at the sentencing heard this from Francisco, he repeatedly asked him why he killed his girlfriend. Francisco's eventual response was less than satisfying. He told the court that there was no justification for what he had done and that he acted impulsively, irrationally, and out of anger. He said that he regrets his actions every day of his life. But the judge was not satisfied, and he reminded Francisco that he had taken the steps of getting his dad's gun and then getting the bullets to load the gun and then went for the drive. The judge told Francisco that those actions aren't impulsive. He also said his claim that the gun was just a scare tactic didn't make any sense. And so the judge asked again why he killed Jackie. And Francisco said, I acted stupidly out of anger. 
Then the judge retorted, is that really the best you can do? Now, both the defense attorney and the Paiute County attorney agreed that Francisco should serve 25 years to life, and the judge complied with that request. The Paiute County attorney, Scott Burns, told the court that these kind of killings don't happen in these small Utah towns, that usually these horrific matters are in larger cities. He then said to the court that the judge, that law enforcement, that the sheriff, that even himself, that they all saw their daughters when they looked at Jackie lying dead in the roadway. Now, Jackie's sister spoke at the sentencing hearing, and she described Jackie as a child who enjoyed life and seemed to always find the good in others, even those who didn't deserve it. She then went on to call Francisco unforgivable and pure evil, and that she hoped he would be in prison for eternity. Now, Jackie's mother was unable to speak in court due to a language barrier. So she instead wrote her statement and Jackie's sister read it aloud. She wrote that there isn't one day that doesn't go by where she isn't thinking about her princess Jackie. And in what might be the saddest comment for me after researching this case, her family lamented that they used to attend Jackie's sporting events, but now their outings are just visits to the cemetery. Now, I don't want to forget McCall. Remember, she's the friend that was shot at by Francisco when she went looking for Jackie. McCall's mother read McCall's statement, saying her daughter was just too emotional to stand before the court. She explained that her daughter had been forced to relive that horrifying night and continually lives with guilt. In such a kind gesture, the judge told McCall that she should not second-guess any of her actions from that night, telling her that Francisco was 100% at fault. He said to McCall that if she had done anything differently on that night, she would not be in the courtroom. He also told the families to move forward and be the best people that they can be because that will be the best revenge they can enact. Francisco's defense attorney did tell the court that Francisco intends to do his time and cause no problems. And I guess we'll just have to see because time will tell. Well, that's your Thursday episode of Rise and Crime. You can follow us on Instagram and TikTok and please subscribe to the YouTube channel. I did have somebody mention that they had a case suggestion on YouTube. You can go ahead and just uh, go to the Instagram page and DM that and we'll make sure that we take a look at that case. Join me again on Monday for more morning crime news. I'm Mama Jules and keep safe out there.